In this video, we're looking at a coil of wire rotated in a constant magnetic field. So I've created this magnetic field by bringing the north pole of a magnet up to the left-hand side, south pole on the right-hand side, creating a uniform rightward magnetic field. And the loop is turning around on an axis like this in this magnetic field. So the magnetic field through the coil is constantly changing. And that means we're going to generate an EMF that's constantly changing to oppose the changes in magnetic field through the coil. And this generated EMF actually turns out to be sinusoidal. So this is the basic operating principle of an electric generator. It's just coils of wire rotating in a strong magnetic field. So we're going to draw the directions of induced current at each point in the rotation, just to get a qualitative sense for what's going on. And then we're going to derive a formula for the EMF as a function of time. And finally, we work a simple example of how to find the peak in RMS AC voltage produced by a rotating coil in a magnetic field. So in the picture, we're going to say that this coil is rotating with an angular velocity of omega. And remember, omega is measured in radians per second. I'll just put that in at the bottom as a reminder that the units of omega are radians per second. Well, if I took omega and multiplied by time, that would give me an angle with respect to the starting value. So that's what I've done in the overhead view in the picture on the right. Radians per second times seconds gives me radians. And I'm going to assume my starting point here is theta equals zero, when the normal vector perpendicular to the surface of the coil was actually perfectly aligned with the magnetic field. After that, my angle at any moment in time is given by omega t. So we can use Lenz's law to find the direction of the induced current in the coil at any point in time in this picture. So we're gonna talk through these step by step and get all the induced currents written in here. So I have some initial orientation where the normal vector is pointing in exactly the same direction as the magnetic field. So that means magnetic flux is coming rightward through the loop in the same direction as the normal vector. And this loop is used to having flux coming through the same direction as the normal vector. So what happens in the second picture when I've rotated my loop so that the normal vector points into the page? That loop is now missing all of those field lines that are coming through the same direction as the normal vector. And current is going to flow in a way that makes up for the change in flux, trying to maintain the original field direction. So my induced magnetic field will be in the same direction as the normal vector. Then I use the Ampere's Law right-hand rule to figure out which way does the current have to flow in order to induce that inward magnetic field. So I want to be able to point my thumb in the direction of current and have my fingers in my right hand wrap around the same direction as that induced magnetic field. And in this case, that current must be looping around in the clockwise direction in order to get this done. So that's my induced current after that first 90 degree flip. And keep in mind, this is only a transient phenomenon and it's only a partial cancellation of the change in flux. And I'm going to say very quickly, my loop is used to having no flux lines pointing through it. But then I quickly flip it another 90 degrees and it started out with very little flux through it, and now it has a bunch of flux opposing the direction of the normal vector. Well, this means current has to be induced to try to get the flux through the loop back to zero. Using the right-hand rule again, I get induced current in the same direction as I did in the previous picture. So where I labeled I in the previous picture, this is now the arrow on the near side of the coil facing us in the third picture. Put my thumb in the direction of that current, loop the fingers of my right hand around, it creates flux out of the loop to try to oppose that change of new magnetic field lines going through the loop opposite to the normal vector. So now let's say the loop is used to having all these field lines opposing the direction of the normal vector, and I rotate into the position of the last picture. The normal vector is now pointing out at us, and that means there's no magnetic flux through the loop from the permanent magnet but my coil was used to having flux coming in opposing the direction of the normal vector. So I need to generate current in a direction that creates magnetic field in the opposite direction of the normal vector. That is now going to be the opposite direction as what it was in the previous picture. Again, I'm just following the same spot on the loop to try to get the 3D visualization to work. I had this little section right here with a current moving clockwise here it was moving up when the loop was rotated towards us and then here suddenly that current is moving down so i have a reversal in the direction of the current i put my thumb in the direction of the current wrap my fingers around using the ampere's law right hand rule 
in the induced magnetic field is into the loop, in other words, opposing the direction of the normal vector to try to keep things the way they were in the prior step with magnetic field lines opposing the normal vector direction. Just to wrap things up, the loop, the loop has almost completed one full rotation and we'll be back to the original picture. So I flip it another 90 degrees and suddenly I have a bunch of new flux pointing in the same direction as the normal vector. The loop is going to try to oppose that and it creates flux opposing the direction of the normal vector. And again, following that same little segment on the wire, that's an induced downward current on the section of the wire that is far from us in this picture. So this is the far side, not the near side. I put my thumb in the direction of that current, wrap the fingers of my right hand around, and that's an induced flux opposing the direction of the normal vector, attempting to cancel out all that new flux in the same direction as the normal vector. So there's qualitatively what happens. I end up with a current flipping back and forth in the loop as it's fighting all these changes in flux from the exterior magnetic field that we're imposing on it. So now we're going to get quantitative with the induced EMF. First, we want to write the flux through one turn of the loop as a function of theta. And that's given by the flux formula. The flux is AB times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the normal vector and the direction of the magnetic field. Then using Faraday's law, we're trying to compute the rate of change in flux to get the induced EMF. So here's how I've written Faraday's law previously. The induced EMF is negative N times the rate of change in the flux. Now this is one case where using finite changes is not going to be very effective, and I'm going to rewrite this as a derivative. So we're going to do just a little bit of calculus here. I'm going to write this as negative N d phi dt. And again, my goal here is to find the induced EMF as a function of time. So what I want is a time derivative of the flux. Well, remember the flux is a function of time because my angle is a function of time, and that's given by omega t. So the flux could be written as AB cosine omega t. Well, that means my induced voltage is given by negative N times the time derivative of AB cosine omega t. And the a and b there are spectators. They're constants. They can move right outside the derivative. And then I need the time derivative of cosine omega t. Well, that's negative sine omega t. But then the chain rule forces me to tack on the derivative of omega t with respect to t, which is omega. Finally, I end up with my induced EMF as a function of time, nab omega sine omega t. And I see that for a loop rotating at a constant rate in a magnetic field, I actually do get a sinusoidal induced voltage. So this is the natural output of an electric generator, a sinusoidal voltage where that coefficient of sine omega t, I could call that epsilon zero, and that would be the peak voltage. There are a couple important qualitative points about this formula. First, if n is bigger, then my induced voltage is bigger. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have more turns in your coil, then you're dealing with bigger induced voltages just because you have more loops to experience flux changes. If I have a bigger area, I get bigger flux changes and therefore bigger induced voltage. If I have a bigger magnetic field, of course that increases the flux and the flux changes, so I get a bigger induced voltage. And if I have a bigger angular velocity, in other words, the spin rate in radians per second, well, that means the fluxes are changing faster. I'm making those delta t's smaller, so I get a bigger induced voltage. So that peak voltage is proportional to all of these things. So there's just one last point I want to make on this slide, and then we'll wrap things up with an example. The problems that we solve involving this generator formula will often give you the frequency of the rotation or the period of the rotation, and you've got to be able to relate that to omega. So I remember for a sinusoidal function that the period is 2 pi divided by the coefficient of t. So there's the relationship to omega. Sometimes it's useful to solve for omega in that. Say omega is 2 pi divided by the period. Just depends on how the problem is given to you. And then frequency is the reciprocal of period. So that must be omega over 2 pi. And sometimes it's useful, again, to solve for omega and write it as 2 pi times the frequency. So when we're working these generator formula problems, you're frequently dealing with these sorts of conversions. 
I'll just leave them here as a side note, and then we'll wrap things up with a little example. So in our example, we have a circular coil of diameter 10 centimeters, diameter 10 centimeters, not radius, and it has 100 turns, and it rotates at 500 rotations per minute, or RPMs, in a constant magnetic field of half a Tesla. So immediately we're dealing with this rotation rate conversion issue. I have 500 rotations per minute, and I wanna get this in radians per second. So I wasn't given a frequency or period this time, I was just given rotations per minute, so it's a little different conversion, and I get two pi radians for rotation. It's doing some unit analysis here and then convert those minutes. So I have one minute for every 60 seconds. My only surviving units here are radians in the numerator, seconds in the denominator, so that's good. And I get 52.4 radians per second. Again, that's omega from our generator formula. What else do I need? I need n, the number of turns, that's 100. I need a. And a clever way to handle this, instead of saying pi r squared, is to say, well, r is d over 2, but when I square that, I get a 1 quarter out in front. So 1 quarter pi d squared. That just allows me to directly plug in the given quantity. The advantage of that is if you have to do precise error analysis, that's really the right way to do it. Of course, we're not doing that in this video, but I thought I'd mention it. And I get 0 0.00785 square meters for that. A coil of that size is surely a very small number of square meters. And then I need the magnetic field strength, which was given to me as half a Tesla. So I'm asked to find the peak voltage, and that's the coefficient of sine omega t in the generator formula. We called it epsilon zero. And it's just the product of all these things. So I have 100 times 0 0.00785 times half a Tesla times my angular speed, so 52.4 radians per second. And I get 20.6 volts for the peak induced voltage. Now remember, this is an AC voltage. So I can also talk about the RMS value of the voltage. And I'll post a link real quick back to where this was first discussed. But as it turns out, the RMS value, that's a type of average, is given by 1 over root 2 times the peak value. And that gives me 14.6 volts. So we've created a simple 14.6 volt AC electric generator. If you find the physics content on Zach's Lab helpful, click on the Zach's Lab logo on the right to browse playlists and subscribe to the channel. I produce over 100 new videos per month, and subscribing is the easiest way to find new content. Thanks for watching.